Hello, welcome. My name is Daniel Dubois, and welcome to another GIS TV 30. This week, the Global Climate Change Week, observed annually from the 14th to the 18th October, GCCW provides an open platform for agencies to register their interest and join a global community working together, raising awareness, inspiring behavior change, and driving transformation in relation to climate policy. Today, we have in studio representatives from the Department of Sustainable Development to add their voice to the global community in celebrating Climate Change Week by having this quick chat under the theme, St. Lucia's Climate Change Story, Celebrating the Work and Charting the Future. Ladies, welcome. Thank, <laughs> Thank you. you. So I'll allow you guys to introduce yourselves. Sure, no problem. Hi, I am Maya Sifley from the Department of Sustainable Development, and I am a Sustainable Development and Environment Officer, and I am the Climate Change Lead at the Department. Hi, Maya. Hi. <laughs> Lovely to be here with you both. I'm Maxine Matthew. I'm the National Project Coordinator for the NAB GCF Readiness Project, which we'll, which we'll discuss today. Thank you very much, Maxime. So, Maya, the Department of Sustainable Development, Tell us some about, give us a little bit more information about the work that you guys do with regards to climate change. Sure. So in a nutshell, we're the climate change focal point to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change and the Paris Agreement and Kyoto Protocol. And basically what that is, these are the bodies that drive climate change action in St. Lucia. So at the department, we guide policy, programs, and plans all related to climate change. And we take an approach where we facilitate, enable, and coordinate climate, ch climate action among different stakeholders in St. Lucia to enable them to be more resilient towards climate change impacts. Thank you very much, Maya. And Maxime, you want to just dive in quickly and give us a little bit more about as National Project Coordinator and your project? Mm -hmm. Um, and we're really grateful for the Department of Sustainable Development as the focal point because what that means is that DSD is able to be an implementing agency on many climate action projects like this one. So the uh, NAP GCF, which is the National Adaptation Planning Green Climate Fund Readiness Project, um, is currently working with the Department of Sustainable Development as well as our nationally designated authority, um, which is the Department of Economic Development, uh, to implement a two, two and a half year uh, project in St. Lucia to enhance our national adaptation planning process. Mm -hmm. So there seems to be a lot of work happening at the Department of Sustainable Development. Um, so Sherry first, and this is for anyone, um, mm -hmm. what are St. Lucia's vulnerabilities with regards to climate change and how does the work that you guys do cover that? Yeah, so St. Lucia is uniquely, you know, placed uh, due to our geographical location, uh, we will experience lots of hurricanes. Um, due to climate change in terms of warming ocean temperatures, this means that the severity and frequency of those hurricanes and storms will increase. Another thing that we are extremely prone to due to having coastal communities, having lots of infrastructure, and of course, our industry of tourism closely tied to our coastlines uh, puts us at risk uh, of increased sea level rise. Uh, so that means that you know erosion, inundation, those things affect us. Um, and when we have tropical cyclones, we of course we know that this affects our hotels, it affects our tourism, it affects our uh, infrastructural assets as well. Um, and another thing in terms of the weather patterns is we are prone to uh, extreme rainfall. So that can be really harmful for those same reasons um, and can lead to uh, excessive flooding, which can, uh, of course, damage our infrastructure, damage homes and livelihoods. Um, and lots of agricultural damage, unfortunately, uh, which is re a really critical uh, industry in, in St. Lucia, uh, critical for our local economy, but also critical for national food security. So in those ways, uh, St. Lucia has many different vulnerabilities to the impacts mm -hmm. of climate change because of uh, our identity as a, as a small developing state in the Caribbean. Absolutely. And Maya, do you want to add to that in terms of what, what really, what our, how do we 
remain vulnerable, mm -hmm. you know, on that front. How do we respond to it, Rabba? Yeah. Uh, yes, yes, <laughs> yes, thank you. Yes, yeah. yes. So, what, how do you fight back, knowing that? Yes. Right. Yes. So, <laughs> as Maxine stated, our vulnerabilities, and as a SIDS, we deal with um, several constraints. Mm. We have financial, human constraints, and yeah. climate change is something very uh, science-based. It's based on and driven scientific data. So, therefore, you need a robust response mm -hmm. and as a small island developing state mm -hmm. our response is ensuring that we have very strategic policy frameworks in place to do this mm -hmm. and at this point I would like to even reference our climate change act of 2024 for example mm -hmm. um, even on that front as St. Lucia we're looked at as a leader in the region for even having this act in place because it demonstrates our commitment to climate change action at the highest level having this endorsed by cabinet mm -hmm. and um, just showing the world that we are ready to set out right in policy and given it this robust and strategic backing that we are ready to tackle climate change impact seriously in St. Lucia. So this act it now gives all of our policies that respond to mitigation, adaptation and loss and damage. It gives it it gives it teeth yeah. and it now highlights the role that different stakeholders play. Um, it highlights our finance mechanisms and just overall capturing our response and what we intend to do mm. to respond to these climate change impacts that are not going to stop it <laughs> in us <laughs> in Tunisia. You, you spoke a lot about policy um, and you know there's a lot to celebrate there. Yes. Yes. But can you also expand on what are the other ways um, St. Lucia is responding to, to climate change? Yes. Uh -huh. Maxime? <laughs> yeah, I can jump in. Um, I mean, policy is a really important uh, pillar, of course, because it does provide the landscape, as Maya mentioned. Um, and what that also then leads into is planning, right? And that's where documents like the NAP, the National Adaptation Plan, which was crafted to uh, be over the time frame of 2020, 2018 to 2028, comes in because that is a great way that something like the climate change adaptation policy becomes expanded upon. So then that takes us into the action, right? So we have the policy framework um, and what is, how do we like implement the, and identify what are the action areas. Mm -hmm. Another important way that we're responding is to ensuring um, that we carry on climate change research and we even have a, a climate change research strategy um, and finally, I would say that uh, a massive, massive um, uh, focus on inclusive stakeholder engagement. So engagement is a massive pillar within St. Lucia's climate response. And that looks like a lot of things, you know, at different levels, um, multi-level engagement, multi-sectoral engagement. Mm -hmm. um, and we're all working together for you know, working towards St. Lucia's climate resilience. And, and climate resilience is just referring to our ability to predict what's, what's to come based on research and to prepare for that. So we know that uh, climate change is happening and the impacts uh, for the most part are unavoidable. Um, but we are able to sort of plan for that a little better. Um, and then we're able to, of course, mitigate based on what's already happening. Nice. I love how you mentioned adaptation and mitigation. Mm -hmm. And Maya, it would be so nice if you could ask, let, some, let us know what's, what is mitigation and adaptation yeah. for, you know, for our viewing audience. Sure, no <laughs> problem. So when we speak about mitigation, it is basically the reduction in greenhouse gases. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that is what is um, warming the earth. And then we want to keep the 1.5 at play. I, I'm sure you remember the 1.5 yes. to stay alive <laughs> campaign. So, yes. And we use that as our benchmark. That is our red line. We, we mm -hmm. cannot go past that. So we have committed to action 
important to ensuring that we do our part in maintaining and not contributing mm. to the rise in mm -hmm. that. Now, somebody may say, well, I mean, St. Lucia, what they emit is negligible. Mm -hmm. Very true. Know, Very correct. <laughs> Very correct. Yeah. But I'll, we're trying. We, we're trying. <laughs> yeah. And then as, as, <laughs> when you're on a global scale, you mm -hmm. still have to show effort. You have to put your money where your mouth is. So mm -hmm. we still have to show action towards mm -hmm. that commitment. And that is why we have our nationally determined contributions, mm -hmm. where we spell out what action we're taking mm -hmm. to reduce greenhouse gases we're actually in the process of reviewing our NDCs right now also quickly I'd like to touch on loss and damage mm -hmm. loss and damage this has been a, a hot topic you may say in the climate change space when you say it's a new concept or it's, it's is not, it something we're trying to coin and craft so that mm -hmm people can understand. It's not new. In okay. fact, SIDS have lobbied for loss and damage to be echoed in the climate space, the, to be captured in the language, mm. in the convention, mm. because we have certain losses that uh, you cannot come back from. There is no remedy for. Mm. And we're not just talking about economic losses. You have cultural losses. You mm. have uh, identity. You have, yeah. it's, it's just a I point you reach. I saw some mental health and the issues. Exactly. The, the after. Exactly. Yeah. And to put a price on that mm -hmm. and to make a case for that, you know, mm -hmm. it's different from adaptation where you mm -hmm. can adjust and like it implies, adapt to this. Yes. Yeah? So we also have work on that front. Mm -hmm. And lastly, adaptation where the work is more tangible and that's where it differs from mitigation mm -hmm. where you may not necessarily see, I mean, apart from your investment in renewable energy where you can see adaptation is really where people on an individual level can make changes mm -hmm. to how we make life more comfortable, how we can actually ensure that we survive, right? Mm -hmm. And, and as, as the country changes and as these impacts continue to hit us, how do we build resilience? And that's mm -hmm. what adaptation is. And adaptation, we really ensure that we have an iterative approach with all stakeholders, we allow stakeholders to identify what are their needs, what are their vulnerabilities, what are the risks, and what is it they need to make their sectors more resilient, mm -hmm. right? So under our national adaptation process, we develop sectoral adaptation strategies and action plans. Mm -hmm. And we allow them to guide this document and to make it look like what they want it to look like. What does climate change resilience look like for their sector? Mm -hmm. And in that, we have measures, outcomes, and most importantly, we identified priority investment areas where they were able to develop concept notes mm -hmm. that can actually enhance their sector with action, actual implementation action nice. to help them adapt. Mm -hmm. And Maxime, I know that our project yeah. is adaptation based, so mm -hmm. I don't know if you want to add to, to Maya's response. For sure, um, particularly the SAS apps that Maya was just referring to. So the NAV does identify uh, eight priority sectors. And that's important because as a country, we came together and the sectoral stakeholders prioritized um, of, our, of all our sectors and all the industries, like what's most important, right? Um, and to complete that adaptation process, the project is working on capacity building and institutional strengthening to be able to complete the remaining three SAS apps. So that is for the education, tourism, and the infrastructure and spatial planning sector. So those are three sectors um, mm. that we will be working on over the next year. And we're really excited about that because we will be able as a country to now show that each of the priority sectors have a SAS app. Um, and this is so critical because the SASAP not only identifies those adaptation measures, as Maya said, it is a basis of for research, right? Mm -hmm. And it is tangible data that will enable us 
to access international um, funding, funding, right? Um, and to access climate finance, and that's so important. So important. A very important part also of having a SaaS app is mm. that it comes with complementary a complementary portfolio of project concept notes. And essentially, all that means is we are drafting with the sectors um, a series of projects that can actually action the measures. So we don't intend at all for the NAP or the SAS apps to be documents on a shelf. They're actionable documents, mm -hmm. they're actionable plans, and that. there are like steps to implementing anything that is identified in there. Absolutely, Maxime. Bankable so just, just, just bankable, bankable projects. Bankable projects, exactly. <laughs> so just hold that thought. Mm. We're going to come back on the project, but right now we're due for a break. All right. We'll be, re we'll be right back. Hello, ECS. Yo, OECS, this is your ocean. If I am to protect your future, we have to work together. It's the time to work together. If I am to help protect your future. Once I used to be so pure and clean. And those hills were so fresh and green. But now you see me as your dumping. Cycle OECS, green actions, blue oceans. Thank you for staying tuned. So, Maxine, before the break, you were letting us know a little bit more about the project. Yeah. And I know coastal um, building coastal resilience is another major component. Mm -hmm. Care to expand? For sure. Um, building our coastal resilience through the project looks like strengthening our research on island. So the project is actually going to be undertaking a number of um, modeling and assessments which will strengthen our ability to, for decision making on a national scale. And it's really, it's really critical um, because as I mentioned earlier, of course, so much of our livelihoods, our infrastructure, our communities are on the coastlines. Um, so any anything that we're hit with, you know, hurricane, sea level rise, um, impacts us greatly. So what will come out of this is um, the ability to uh, have our coastal maps, to be able to model what different risks look like up to 50 years in the future, 100 years in the future. And that kind of technical information is what the institutions need to be able to effectively plan, right? You need the research, you need an understanding of your context to have effective plans. So we're happy because that will support the SAS app development, but it will just support the overall adaptation planning process. Nice. So mm -hmm. I'm, um, I know Maya, so Inusha does not do um, adaptation work in a silo. It's, mm -hmm. We're part of a global community, mm -hmm. and um, we're happy to be able to talk about that today. Mm -hmm. So what, what what is the role multilateral um, funding agencies play in supporting mm -hmm. St. Lucia's climate change response? OK, so essentially, the multilateral funding agencies are here to fund <laughs> what we want to implement. <laughs> I mean, we mm -hmm. have advanced in several policies and plans. And you hear it all the time. Oh my mm. gosh, so much paperwork, yes. this plan, that plan. <laughs> what are we doing with it? Bring mm. the money and yeah. we're going to show you what <laughs> we can do with it. But yeah. I mean, yeah. So these mechanisms have been set in place to assist SIDS, like St. Lucia, to access funding mm -hmm. because and anybody would tell you that not all funding agencies are created the same. Some of them are quite uh, tedious and you require a certain level of expertise to even access those funds mm -hmm. to put solid proposals together. The evidence-based right. um, data that Maxime touched on, this is mm -hmm. critical for us. So what her project touches on mm -hmm. enhances that and 
places us in a better position to put together strong proposals so that we can enhance and build up how we um, access those various funds. Um, so like I said, for us, it's, it's very cut and dry. Yeah. Yeah. You have the money, we have our needs, mm. and we have a clear map as to how, where we want to go with it. And I also want to touch on the fact that our climate change action, we don't do it in a silo, as you said. Mm. We ensure that it is aligned with our national planning. It is not done in isolation, mm -hmm. right? So for example, the Department of Economic Development, they play a critical role in all climate action. And they ensure that it is aligned with our national development and what we want to see as a as a nation mm -hmm. so it is aligned for example our NAB is aligned with the medium term development strategy and that that synchronicity is what is essential so that the country is basically on the same page and we can basically capture and get that resilience that we want as an island right and the concept of readiness mm -hmm. you know what does it mean to be ready yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we say the NAB GCF Readiness Project, right? Um, and what does that really mean? Uh, readiness is, you know, referring to uh, how prepared your country is to be able to access the finance, as Maya said. Um, so it is all nice and good to have plans, but there is a lot of, like, strengthening um, that actually make you able to access it and, and effectively implement based on that finance. So readiness looks like ensuring that we have the right capacity building measures, um, ensuring that we have strong stakeholder engagement, um, and then, of course, just leading you closer and closer to be able to mobilize the climate finance. And that is the way forward for long-term resilience. So funders like the Green Climate Fund, who is funding this project, we have the Adaptation Fund, um, we have the Global Environment Facility. Those are critical climate funds, multilateral climate funds for us um, in St. Lucia that we're able to work towards. So um, our plans are not in vain. A component of this project is also strengthening our institutional technical capacity in terms of writing those project um, concepts and proposals. As Maya said, some of these applications are tricky. Some are like very uh, high level. Yeah, <laughs> high level. Um, and some things are built to, to, you know, so that it is difficult. Um, but we're happy to be able to provide that technical support to ensure that at the end of all of this, we have at least one project proposal to be able to be submitted uh, to one of these funding agencies. Mm -hmm. And briefly, mm -hmm. um, this is for both of you. For sure. Mm -hmm. What sectors are leading in adaptation? Mm -hmm. You know, I know. <laughs> I like that because <laughs> you know the boss, you know the officers. They know their work so deeply. They're you know, like we're doing so much work. So just them. let I know the champions. You know, let us know what sectors. I know there's a lot of work happening at DSD. What sectors are really leading and embracing adaptation? Okay, so Danielle, I will start with a little preamble here. Go so ahead. when we started our national adaptation planning and we brought all stakeholders on board, they went through a ranking process where they mm. ranked the eight priority sectors of not most important to least important, but which ones needed urgent attention, mm. right, from one to eight. And in that exercise, water came out as the number one priority area, followed mm -hmm. by agriculture, then fisheries, then we had resilient ecosystems. Mm -hmm. Health also embarked on developing um, an HNAP, a Health National Adaptation Planning, but it mirrors our other sectoral adaptation strategies and action plans. Mm -hmm. And we have GCF assisting us with our other um, SAS apps. However, mm -hmm. I love to use the water sector as the model child because they've really embraced and they understand because they're on the ground and they feel the impact. We feel the impact as a country. Mm -hmm. Water is such a precious resource. Mm -hmm. So they have literally aligned the measures that they shared in their SAS app to their work program. Mm -hmm. So they actually measure and ensure that climate resilience is built into whatever projects, whatever um, 
interventions that they make and that is critical for us because this is what we want to see we cannot tell any sector exactly what to do you need to identify your to vulnerabilities and risk take ownership mm -hmm. and then ad advise on what action can be taken and that is that is how we build resilience in San Lucia one sector at a time <laughs> <laughs> and one sector one community at a time yeah so you know we're coming towards the end of our show this morning mm -hmm. um, as we conclude Maxime let us know what's next for the NAP GCF readiness project well, um, we're really excited to embark on the development of those three SaaS apps in the coming year. Um, we also will be prioritizing private sector engagement. We understand that engaging private sector leaders and actors, not only in the planning process, but also in the implementation process and to help build their um, business acumen for um, climate smart innovation, for example, is critical. So that will be a major thrust in the coming year as well. Um, and our coastal modeling um, component is well underway. I'm happy about this. Um, so at the end of next year, we'll for sure have a lot to show in terms of reporting. Um, so we have a busy year ahead of us mm -hmm. um, at the NAB GCF Readiness Project. <laughs> um, but it's a lot of critical work and important work that will lead to um, proper mobilization of, re of resources of climate finance. Um, and I'm really happy to know that our national institutions will be strengthened through the work in this project. Absolutely. And Maya from the DSD, our DSD champion, <laughs> climate <laughs> officer, what, what's next for the office? You know, what work will you guys continue to do? Well, coming up next month, actually, we have COP29, and that would be hosted in, in Azerbaijan, Baku. And this is wow. dubbed the Finance COP. And as it implies, we are ready for countries to put <laughs> their money where their mouth <laughs> is, yeah. especially in seeing the operation operationalization of the loss and damage fund mm -hmm. yeah. you know we don't want just what looks good or what they think we want to hear mm -hmm. we need finance we need the concessional finance in order to make climate change action happen in St. Lucia. So that is really important to us. And we plan on making stellar representation at COP29, along with our other SIDS counterparts in mm -hmm. AOSIS, through AOSIS and CARICOM, because we have areas of convergence that we'd like to see. And you know, you, your voice is amplified when you have the numbers. So that yeah. is what we're trying to do. And the platform. And the platform. And the there platform. You go. So we have one more minute. What's the takeaway? What do we want to leave with our audience here this morning? Um, I think what's important is for everyone to know that there is a role for each of us, um, no matter how big or small. Um, the impacts will be felt by all of us in, in different ways. Um, but it is, it is important for us to adapt, it's important for us to care about building our resilience. I know that sometimes it's a lot of technical information, but I invite people to engage with the department and look at our, our awareness products um, to understand that you already know what climate change is, you know your lived experience, um, and we're just working together to, to make that um, set in stone as we yeah, as we adapt to it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, uh, like Maxine said perfectly, uh, we don't <laughs> want anyone feeling divorced from the process at all. In fact, recently we concluded some great work with the youth in engaging them and, and having them bring out the message of climate change. That is important because you know what they learn from now and what they're able to take up, they're the ones who are really going to champion this effort and push and agitate for change. And so on that note, we just want to encourage everyone, every sector, business, mm -hmm. community, yeah. household, <laughs> and individual at a time to yeah. take on climate change action, whatever you can do, because we are feeling it, we're living it, and this is our reality. It's yeah. our shared reality. It is our shared reality. Ladies, thank you so much for being here with us this morning. Thank you. Thank you for the work that you do every single day. And that's the end of our TV 30 this morning. Thank you so much, and as we conclude, Please enjoy one of DSD's latest productions, a 15-minute documentary entitled St. Lucia's Climate Resilience Journey. Bye. Bye.
This is a story about change and how the small island developing state of St. Lucia will navigate the ever-growing threat of climate change. This is a story about planning and response. What can we do? What have we done? And why climate change adaptation is an urgent matter of consideration and action. Join us as we dive into St. Lucia's climate resilience journey. In just about four hours, Tropical Storm Debbie dumped 10 inches of rain on St. Lucia, triggering landslides and flooding never experienced before. This three-foot entrance was once the front door of Bacadal family's residence, now just another victim of Thomas. It all started on Saturday, October 30th, 2010, from about 9 a.m. Many homes were destroyed, lives were lost, including a mother and her two sons, when their home was buried under an avalanche of mud and water. I've invested in so far as most persons know, it's no, no secret. But what's more important is the ability for our people in the time of adversary to come together and to rise to the occasion. With excessive greenhouse gas emissions blanketing the earth and trapping the sun's heat, over a long period of time, these excess emissions cause an imbalance in the earth's climatic system, bringing hotter days and prolonged periods of drought, among other impacts. A trip to St. Lucia's largest water reservoir revealed the startling effects of climate change. And welcome to the, to the Sir John Compton Dam. This is the area that is in the entire north of the island, most likely about 90% of the island being fed from this water source, from this, from this dam. So we are thankful that you could visit the dam because right now we are facing a crisis. Um, it has not reached to proportion yet, but we are, right now we are 317.6 feet, right? And this, if we continue in this format, then we will be losing about six inches of water per day. So in essence, we are not meeting our full capacity when it comes to production. In order for us to sustain the population that we are feeding, we need about 8.5 to 10 million gallons of water, right? And right now we are feeding just about 60% of that coming out of this, this lake. We can't help turn the tides against our rapidly changing climate and its dreadful effects by preparing for and responding to its impacts. As a nation and as a people, we hold immense power and responsibility to safeguard our homes, livelihoods and heritage against the expected effects of climate change. We must embrace adaptation to build our climate resilience. Climate resilience is the ability to anticipate, prepare for, and respond to hazardous events, trends, or disturbances related to climate. Improving climate resilience involves assessing how climate change will create new or alter current climate-related risk and taking steps to better cope with these risks. So, what is St. Lucia doing to build climate resilience? St. Lucia is uh, taking every effort to build its climate resilience and it's doing so in a number of ways. It's looking at the policy uh, environment, it's looking at legislation uh, in terms of awareness raising, capacity building as well, but also looking at actions that can be taken on the ground, very tangible actions that can be taken to help um, if, if addressing climate change. The NAP is the National Adaptation Plan, and that is a strategy that allows uh, one to see, or a country to see, what it can do to help build its climate resilience, what it can do to help it better cope with climate change. And St. Lucia's NAP, that contains actions, is a 10-year document, a 10-year NAP, that goes from 2018 to 2028. The goal of the NAP is to strengthen St. Lucia's resilience to climate change and to support the implementation of the country's climate change adaptation policy. The NAP highlights eight priority sectors for adaptation action, 
further elaborated in its associated Sectoral Adaptation Strategies and Action Plans, or SASAPs. Under the National Adaptation Plan, that's, that is the umbrella document for adaptation, we have what we call Sectoral Adaptation Strategies and Action Plans, or SASAPs. Those are able to go into more detail as to what St. Lucia wants to do to help it build climate resilience, to help it cope better with the adverse impacts of climate change. And it does that uh, across a number of sectors, sectors such as water, agriculture, fisheries, resilient ecosystems, infrastructure and spatial planning, health, education, as well as tourism. So those are the eight sectors found in St. Lucia's umbrella nap through its SAS apps. And those SAS apps are allowing us to be able to take action in the short term, the medium term, and the long term. Let's zone into a few sectors and let's see what they're doing to build climate resilience. Coral gardeners in St. Lucia are working together to save reefs from the devastating effects of climate change through a flagship project consistent with the island's National Adaptation Plan. My name is Chanela James and I'm a coral gardener. I've been a coral gardener for the past seven years of my life. My job as a coral gardener is to enhance the, the reef, bring them back to life, because most of our reef, our coral reef, has died out because of human activities. It is important because my family is a, mostly a fishing village. Where we live is a fishing village and we depend mostly on fishes. So. In order to help them out, we as coral gardeners are building the reef back to increase the fishing population right there in Sufre. Well, what we've done is actually with our coral restoration program, which is amazing, because what we've done with it is that we've actually taken some of those coral, especially our elkhorns and stagons, because they are the fastest growing ones that we have in our Caribbean region and we've actually created uh, what we call nurseries, quote unquote, that we've actually put them in a sheltered area that allows them to grow um, at a faster rate than they would in their natural habitat because they're closer to the surface at about 15 to 20 feet of water and they're able to grow faster. And after that, within a year, especially the staghorns, they're able to grow from 10 centimeters to about a foot square. So we're able to take that off and bring it back out into their natural habitat, transplant them, or we call them outplant, outplant them back into the reef. Therefore, by doing that at a faster rate, uh, you have the coral growing and you have them surviving so that they create habitats for our small fish, as well as hopefully as they keep growing, that they would create a better protection for our coastal areas where erosion um, seaside erosion is concerned. Um, I've changed my production method. Um, I have an aquaponics system. Basically, aquaponics use 90% less water than traditional agriculture, where we recirculate the water and the, we have fish in there. The fish basically provide nutrients for the plants and the plants filter the water for the fish. Um, on top of that, I've build an 80,000 tanks rainwater harvesting. Um, so I harvest water, water from all my greenhouses with that. I also um, tap into a government um, supply irrigation system, tap um, getting water from the river. So that is like 1.2 kilometers away. And I pump the water into my tank in the dry season. Climate adaptation is the steps that you actually take to deal with the expected changes and variability in the climate, right? So for us, it is simple. We, as a man say, if you're feeling hot, plant a tree. If you are, if you, if you want shade, plant a tree. If you want fruit, plant a tree. And for forest, forestry, what we're saying is, this is very true, that we can actually adapt to the expected changes through the planting of trees, through better management of the existing um, um, floral, the ex existing vegetation, through the protection and management of our, of our biodiversity, right? We can build resilience. Without data, 
we cannot do anything. So the manual stations is being done every day of the month of the year, whether it be Christmas, whether it be Easter, whether it be raining, storm, whatever. Somebody have to come out. This station now, right, right, is one of our climate change projects underneath the we have um, optimization of the hydrological network, right? That was a World Bank project. Now, with the project you do now on the NAP, this is one of the ways, right? We could get data, right? To affect the adaptation processes, methods, towards climate change. This school is the only school on island so far, is the model, that could just run on autopilot. You don't have to be wondering, oh, where are we going to get water to clean the school, the children? No. So here, it is one of our key adaptations combating drought, climate change, collecting rainwater, right? As an alternative source of our water. Despite the significant strides made in developing SASAPs and seeing the implementation of projects in the works, many barriers remain that limit St. Lucia's ability to implement prioritized measures needed to actively strengthen the country's climate change resilience to safeguard lives, livelihoods, and our heritage. This is where the support from multilateral funds like the Adaptation Fund and Green Climate Fund together with bilateral and other sources come in to bolster countries' ability to adapt by remedying issues and seeking to address barriers that stand between non-action and implementation. Out of the eight sectors identified in the NAP, five have SASAPs and three more remain to be developed under the current GCF Readiness Project focused on enhancing St. Lucia's national adaptation planning process. Well, this readiness project is, is, you know, aims to achieve quite a number of things, but it's building on the work that we've done so far. Um, one key aspect of this is to be able to inform on things like the coastal vulnerability of St. Lucia as it relates to climate change. You know, what, what is the likely impact from sea level rise? What is the likely impact from um, hurricanes in this region and how that could potentially impact on um, the vulnerability of St. Lucia as a small island developing state? Beyond that, you know, developing the capacity of um, both technocrats and other high-level officials in terms of their understanding, as well as to improve the learnings on national adaptation planning in St. Lucia, so that you know, all aspects of society are informed. But in terms of from the higher up, you know, there's a clear understanding and direction for the, the process and the work that's being done in country to support the national adaptation planning process. The GCF Readiness Project intends to build St. Lucia's climate resilience through enhancing St. Lucia's NAP process by developing sectoral adaptation plans, which will be based on a strong climate rationale and through active stakeholder engagement. This will ensure that we can have strong implementation of our adaptation actions and be able to access climate finance once we've prioritized our project ideas and scope. We all have a significant role to play in this story and joining the fight to bolster St. Lucia's climate change adaptation efforts in any way augurs well for all of us. From contributing to policy, regulatory or institutional change, to securing funding to upgrade essential technology or infrastructure, raising awareness, building capacity, undertaking critical research for informed decision making, to the actions we take at home. What we do today can significantly impact and shape the future. No, absolutely. Without adaptation, you can you can grow no crops, you can grow nothing. So you need to adapt so that you can continue production. Without, um, there is no agriculture, no food, no business. We must adapt and the time is now. And each of us has a role to play. From our homes, our conservation habits, our waste management habits, it's important that we start at home. And it's also important that we start in our businesses and our communities. We can, we can all play a part. Right? No matter how young we are, how old we are, we all have, we can all contribute towards that. And we can contribute by 
planting trees. Every walk of life, every level, everyone has a part to play in, in building this climate resilience, in contributing to the solution. Because at the end of the day, if you are not part of the solution, then you're part of the problem. Um, adaptation, I think, it's a continuity from where we start in now, continue going. I don't think we'll ever stop adaptation. We just have to improve it as we go along. To move a nation, it takes one person, one household, one enterprise, one community, and one sector at a time. Building climate resilience, adaptation is everyone's business.